Well, I'm delighted to conclude this series that we could go on and on on this one, on standing strong. Um, Paul's great analogy on spiritual warfare, when you read Ephesians 6, is, is uh, um, fantastic. I mean, he's had five and a half years observing Roman soldiers. Sometimes he's chained to them. Uh, you know, in Caesarea, he's in prison, and uh, they're bringing him in and out all the time for conferences and find out what he's up to. And uh, amazing story, really, there in uh, Palestine, as he's in jail there for a couple of years. Different governors, you know, and kings were interviewing him. But there's soldiers watching him all the time. Then in Rome, in house arrest, and then in the Mamertine jun- uh, dungeon before his execution. At times, he was chained to them. And some of the guards were Hit- uh, sorry, Hitler's, uh, Caesar's personal bodyguard the Praetorian Guard, and these were the toughest, strongest soldiers. And so he, he observed them, getting undressed, dressed, all that stuff. And, uh, and he sees that they have weapons, and he outlines the defensive armoury of these Roman soldiers. And, uh, he, you know, the defensive armoury, you see them there. Um, I've got get my notes together and I'll be able to... Belt, the underlying girdle, belt. I've got a belt, you can't see it. Usually belts are, oh, but they hold everything together. If my belt was loose, it'd be tragic if everything fell down. Um, but Paul says, look, this is the internal girdle that these soldiers had strapped to their chest and abdomen because everything else fitted there. And if it was loose, they were in trouble. Their undergarments had to go underneath them. So he says, that's truth. Truth in the inwards parts. Jesus is truth and we're to be truth tellers in every way. And the breastplate that fitted over the soldier. And uh, that speaks of a right standing with God, he said. You know, it covers the vitals, the heart. And having a right standing, you live the right way for him. The shield, it's the shield of faith, he says, that protects you. Huge seal that the Romans had. The helmet fastened on was the helmet of He said, assurance of salvation. Shoes, they always wore their shoes, ready for any, for marching. And they leather shoes, but they had uh, brass and iron greaves underneath for grip and also so so they wouldn't damage their feet because the enemy would put spikes on the road to try and immobilize them. So that's the offensive uh, weaponry. Let me show you a photo of a Roman soldier. Someone said he looks like Dave Wabnitz. And I think he looks more Italian. There he is. And that shield was pretty big. It covered him. And uh, the helmet, the breastplate. And um, everything. So Paul is saying, these speak, the, the, these, these speak to me of spiritual truths that we need to have God's armour on. Um, we must put on all of God's armour, he says. He says that again and again in the feast. All of it, all of it, all of it. See, remember King David. It says when kings were out fighting and it was the time for war, it goes, they didn't come back and have a siesta. But David decided, oh, I'll leave it to, to Joab and my other generals. I'll come back to the palace and take it easy. He took his armour off. By putting off his armour and returning to his palace, he was in far greater danger than when he was on the battlefield. Because we're never out of reach of Satan's scheming. So we must never be without the whole armour of God. And um, this defensive armoury is there. Now the offensive weapon is the sword. And I've got a photo of the sword there. There it is, it's around two foot long, the blade, and um, it was a deadly sword. Uh, If you track through the history of how they evolved into getting that sword, they had ideas they they pinched from the Celts and also from the Spaniards, and uh, about 200, 250 BC, they started using that weapon, and historians say that weapon conquered the world. 
two foot long, sharp blade at the end, not right through. It could cut a little bit, but it's mostly a point. And what the Romans came up with was this way by which they could psychologically prepare their men to be undefeated. And they figured out that the best way is for a soldier to be able to look at his enemy in the eye with a short sword and not be fearless and to be able to stab him in the throat or in the stomach and kill him instantly. Not throw a spear, not arrows, but face to face. And it scared the living daylights out of all the other armies because these boys were so trained physically and psychologically that they were fearless, they were, that they were undefeated in their mental attitude. So that weapon conquered the world over a 300 year period. So Paul is looking at this and he says, man, that's the, that's, that's the offensive weapon. The belt, the breastplate, the shield, the helmet, the, the shoes, these are defensive weapons. You don't find Roman soldiers using their, their shield as a battering ram to clobber the enemy. You don't find them kind of taking the helmet off and throwing it at them. No, no, no. It, the, the, the only weapon they had was this long, this short sword, not a long sword. They figured the size of it was important because some other nations had huge swords that required, and they figured they can't manoeuvre. These guys with the short sword can manoeuvre really quick, can look the person in the eye, chase straight after them and kill them instantly. Terrible weapon. Paul said, that, that is the weapon of the word of God in the hearts and minds of God's people. He saw, he saw the belt, truth, and breastplate, righteousness, shield, faith, helmet, salvation, shoes, the gospel. He saw the sword as being the word of God. He said, and take the sword of the Holy Spirit. That's the scripture. Ephesians 6, 7, and take the sword. Huh? You've got to take it. Don't just hold it in your scabbard. You've got to bring it out. You've got to take it. It's the sword of the Holy Spirit, which is the word of God. The sword was the only weapon which could be clearly used for attack and, and it involved close personal encounter. The Greek word is the word macharia, which is actually a short sword. And uh, the spiritual significance, as I've said, is Paul says, this is the word of God. The scriptures are the Holy Spirit's weapon. We don't fight our spiritual enemies with our natural human weapons. Peter tried this in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, I'm gonna help out Jesus. I'm gonna overcome the tempter. He was all crazy, Peter was crazy. He hadn't listened to Jesus' words that he, Jesus needed to, to go to the cross to die for the sins of the world, but that God would raise him up from the grave, like we sang. So he pulls out a natural sword. I'm gonna help Jesus. The arm of the flesh, he uses a, a jolly sword and nearly kills a police officer. And he would have been hanging next to Jesus on a cross. So he's, he thinks spiritual warfare is, I'll, I'll just use my own strength, my own ingenuity, my own weapons of war. But 50 days later, he had learnt the lesson. He had repented for his sins. He had put things right with Jesus. He had put things right with the other disciples. And on the day of Pentecost, you know what happened there? He didn't pull out a physical sword. But as things are happening, he pulls out the sword of the spirit from his own heart and he's able just to, to take that sword, the word that had been implanted in his heart. He hadn't had the time for Bible study and, and what he had meditated on, what he'd reflected on, what he'd memorized, he immediately saw the circumstance, Joel 2, Psalm 110. And out comes the word, out comes the sword and he's able to slay spiritual enemies, break open people's hearts for the Spirit of God to win them over to faith in Christ. He understood the power of a spiritual weapon, an offensive weapon using the Word of God to break through in people's lives. And you don't know how much power there really is when the memorized Word that's in your heart, when the Holy Spirit uses it and you give it to somebody. It's powerful, it can transform people's thinking can transform their hearts, it can prick their conscience, it can cause them to come alive in faith as we use the sword of the Spirit in our personal witnessing and sharing and in our personal lives. 
It's the Holy Spirit that renders God's word powerful to us. Look at Hebrews 4.12, I love this one. Hebrews 4.12 says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It doesn't say it's just a dead letter. It doesn't say it's weak. It's just in black and white. It's just in pages. It's just ink. He says, the word of God is alive. It's powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. You saw that Roman sword. This is more powerful. Cutting between soul and spirit. The word can, can cut right through people's minds and, and, and hearts and, and, and wills and defense mechanisms and get into their spirit and be able to cause spiritual life to come and burst in them. So people get saved. You can't save a soul. I can't save anyone. All I can do is faithfully use the sword of the spirit that's in my heart and share it with people and trust that he will do the work. The Holy Spirit being the author of the scriptures is the best one qualified to direct us how to use the scriptures effectively. The Holy Spirit wrote the Bible and the Holy Spirit wields the Bible, the word, as we take it by faith and use it in our lives. We have to take it. So Paul says, take the sword of the Spirit. You gotta use it in your life through your life, particularly in overcoming temptation. Oh, there are many temptations that come our way. And our good and compassionate God has given us his word so we can use it in resisting the many temptations that can come our way. And uh, you might say, oh, I've been a Christian for a long time now. You know, I don't have the same temptations I had back then, maybe not, but there are other ones, more sophisticated ones. I've been a Christian 51 years. I'm not automatically immune from temptation, neither are you. You learn to overcome one, but the other one comes, come, comes along. And so none of us are automatically immune from the devil's influence. We have the victory through Christ's death and resurrection and the giving of the spirit we, he's given us weapons of warfare, defensive pieces and this offensive, weapon. we've got to use it, we've got to put them on. We've got to put on the helmet, you've got to put on your shoes, you've got to put on the breastplate, you've got to grab the, the shield, take the sword, you've got to actually use them. And uh, I look at Jesus and I think, man, he overcame the vicious and cruel temptations of the enemy. And immediately after, his great act of obedience. So he's 30 years of age. He's been a good boy to Mary and Joseph. The father is so pleased with him. He hasn't sinned. He's fully God, but he's fully human. When did Jesus realize he's fully God? We don't know. Not as a baby, not as a little toddler, but somehow maybe at 12 years of age, he started figuring out some stuff. By the time he was a teenager, he's probably thinking, Mary may have told him the stories. So, but he's been a good young man. He's never sinned. So he goes to John the Baptist. He says, baptize me. It's his cousin. John the Baptist goes, I can't baptize you. I know who you are. You're God in human form. Because I'm not even worthy to, un to, to undie. Tie up your shoelaces. You know what Jesus said to him? John, Johnny, 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 you're my cousin. This is my interpretation. Just do it. It's the right thing to do. But, 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 you were done as a baby. Doesn't matter, I'm an adult now. I was done as a baby. Christen, I don't despise my parents for doing that. We dedicate babies. We christen babies. We respect the different traditions, but every single person has got to come to a personal knowledge of Jesus as their saviour. Every single person. God's got no grandchildren. He's only got children. They've got to be born into his kingdom. So as an 18 year old, after I got saved, I got baptized in water, obeying Jesus. So Jesus himself, so, so I would say to you, if you haven't been baptized in water, you say, well, I don't know. Just get baptized in water, just obey Jesus. He says, do it. He led by example. He's not saying do something that I haven't done. He was 30 years of age and he got baptized. He said to John, he says, just do it. He gets baptized and the, and the heavens open, it's like, the father for 30 years is silent and the heavens roll back and a voice from heaven comes down. 
And it says, that's my boy. I love him. Ah, oh, he's the apple of my eye. I love him. This is Jesus, my son. The father was so happy. Then the spirit of God comes on him. He gets baptized in the Holy Spirit. John says, like a dove came on him. And you would think now, he's obedient, brought a baptism. He's baptized in the Holy Spirit. He has the power of God. Now he's ready for ministry. Now he's ready to, do you know what he's ready for? A vicious attack of the devil. Whenever you get close to God and you start obeying him and you start trusting him, you start moving forward in him, mark my words, he will attack. He won't attack you while you're doing nothing. If you're not praying, if you're rarely going to church, if you go, oh, come to church once a month or once every, you're half backslidden. He's not gonna attack you. Now you're coming to church each week and you know, you're, you're in small group, you're reading your Bible, you're witnessing, you're, you're getting on fire. He is gonna oppose you. You start obeying him. You start putting your trust in him. You start getting filled with the spirit. He's gonna oppose you. And he viciously attacked Jesus out in the wilderness. And it's interesting how Jesus overcame him. So the devil comes to him and Jesus doesn't go, oh, shock, horror. Satan, can we sit down and have a discussion over this? You know, can we just be reasonable about this and, and, and uh, let, let's sit down and reason and debate this? No, 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 no. You can never debate the devil. He'll win every time. He's the most unreasonable, vicious, hateful being. He hates God, he hates you. He wants your eternal soul to go to hell with him. And he will do anything and everything to take you with him. And so you cannot beat the devil at his own game. You can't debate temptation. You've got to draw a line in the sand and say, I ain't talking to you. If you want to talk, you go and talk to Jesus. I'm not talking to you. I'm not debating you. I'm going to resist you. I'm going to stand against you. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He says, devil, I'm not talking to you. In fact, what happened was, you don't find Jesus going, oh, I'm in trouble, I'm being tempted. Where's a scripture that I can use? Oh, I wish I had there's something in Exodus. Oh, I wish I had the scroll that I learned. Or maybe, oh, there's one in Deuteronomy. Where is that, that scripture? Oh, if I only had the scroll, do some Bible study. Too late, the devil's attacking. The word had to be in him, memorized, imbibed, part of his whole life. And in the midst of this vicious attack, out comes the sword of the spirit, shoot. Deuteronomy 4, you devil, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He stabs him in the guts. Oh, I like it. Dig it in. Give it to him. The only way you can defeat him is through what God says in his word about you and the promises that he has given to you. And you take the sword and you wield it. Every time the devil came, he came three times. Jesus didn't back down. He just says, nah. Not talking to you, the word says this, the word says this. He quotes scripture, but it, it was scripture that was memorized, that was on the inside of his life. He might say, oh, it's not gonna happen to me. It'll happen to you. So there'll be a crisis. There'll be something that takes place. That's life. Life sends us curved balls. There are things that happen all the time. And it's too late and say, oh, I need to do Bible discovery. I need to learn. Learn the scripture now. Memorize the scripture and make sure that that weapon of war is as sharp as can be. So the Holy Spirit can take what you've got on the inside and wield it against the enemy and you win a victory every time. It's true. That's how Jesus overcame. Jesus succeeded because the Holy Spirit enabled him to draw from the word that had already been implanted in his heart and we overcome the same way. Jesus sets the pattern for us to follow and he used that scripture in Deuteronomy. He thrust it at the enemy. Don't try and reason with temptation. Don't do David. David was a silly man. He thinks he can overcome sexual temptation by walking towards it. Sees this beautiful looking creature. He's not sinning by seeing her. He's not sinning by saying, wow, she is a pretty good looker. That's okay. Men think that way. Women think that way. I mean, my wife and my daughters, they see this 
semi-clad man with muscles on his muscles, and they all go, oh, look at that. And I say, what's the matter with you girls? Look at us, look at your husbands. And it forces me to go to my local gym and I've got my dumbbells and I'm gonna start doing this and so my wife can say, whoa, look at those. Is that a sin for my wife and daughters to admire a good looking male body? No, it's what you do with it. It's the second look, it's the third look, it's the imagination, it's the planning, it's the scheming, it's the immorality and adultery of the heart that's the sin. So David sees this creature, he should have said, hey, she's fantastic, I've got a wife at home. I'm feeling like it, so I'm gonna go home and we're gonna do it. Legal. But he doesn't, he walks towards her, walks towards her. Ends up committing adultery, ends up murdering her husband. I mean, he just ruined his life. He found forgiveness in, by the grace of God. But by golly, he wrecked his kids. Every one of his sons became a monster. All except Solomon. And even at the end, he just went astray. Every son, every child was just dysfunctional. Hated their father. Hated God. Turned against, just wrecked them. Joseph, I mean, what a wonderful young man. You read the story? There she is. Mrs. What's her name? Potiphar. Whoa, she comes this way. He goes that way. She wants him. She wants to take him into her bedroom. She's a serial adulterer. She sees this good looking fella. He doesn't go, hey, Mrs. Potiphar, let's sit down and debate this. You're a good looking woman. I know I'm a good looking fella. Can we just sit down and work out an accommodation? No way. You don't fight it with your mind. You fight it with your legs. You run away from it. Paul says, flee fornication, flee anger, flee bitterness, flee those things that give the devil a foothold. Can't reason with temptation. Oh, I'd like to take that thing to steal it. You just go, no, 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 no. Stealing is not part of the Christian life. Or lying or cheating or, you just, no, 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 you draw lines in the scene. You say, no, 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 I ain't doing that stuff. I'm not gonna discuss it in my own mind or when the enemy attacks, it's just no. No, 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 no. I ain't going there. So Jesus didn't reason with the enemy. He simply resisted by relying on God's powerful promise that was relevant for his situation. Folks, God's word has got to be in us as it provides the raw material for the Holy Spirit to use to help us in our times of need. The moment you leave this weapon, you put it on the ground and say, I don't need it. It's as if you're gonna, you know, if you start throwing away your sword, you think you can use your naked hands in conflict with the enemy? That's all you'll have. Won't work. Look what Paul says to the Colossians. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. In all wisdom. You need his wisdom through his word. And notice this. The context is you need church. You need people around you. You say, oh, I've just got Jesus in the word. That's all I need. No, you don't. You need Sunday church. You need small group. You need to commit yourself regularly. If you're watching online, great you're watching online, but get here as soon as you can. Reactivate yourself. He says, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. This is fellowship. This is like, you need each other. I need you. You need me. Singing with grace in your heart to God. So you see, word fellowship, worship. This is why being in close fellowship with your brothers and sisters is so important. We need to be under the authoritative preaching of the word in a worshiping community of Christ followers like this. And this is where we're constantly being encouraged on our spiritual journey and helping one another to overcome the many wiles of the devil. There are many wiles. And there's some things that, man, I, I need to talk to somebody about this. I need somebody who's spiritually wise and who's gone there, how do you overcome? The second thing Paul says here, it's not technically a spiritual, one of the weaponry of the soldiers, but he, he talks about prayer in the Holy Spirit. He talks about the, the word being the sword of the spirit. And now he says prayer needs to be energized and empowered by the Holy Spirit. 
It's not just a human thing of praying. It's actually getting power behind your prayers, transformation on the inner, inner life so that your prayers become powerful. Scriptures and, scripture and prayer belong together as the two chief offensive weapons which the Holy Spirit puts in our hands to use. So Paul thinks of prayer as something, I think that is to pervade all our spiritual warfare. He is saying that each piece of the armour, helmet, breastplate, everything, because put it on with prayer, dependence on Jesus. You're putting on Jesus. Prayer empowers and enables us as spiritual soldiers to wear the armour and to wield our sword. Look what Ephesians says. And he finishes, this is what he finishes on. Pray in the spirit at all times on every occasion. At all times and on every occasion. Stay alert. And be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. That's why we say pray for our churches, the Christian Family Centre churches. We know them, they're our our babies, we've given birth to them. I visit them, I love them. I see the need that John and Sue have in in Darwin. You've got to believe what they're doing. He's a full-time university professor. She's a full-time high school teacher. Every Saturday, every Sunday, they're cooking food, preparing and they, they, the indigenous people that come are homeless people. So up to 60, 70 of them, maybe up to 100 altogether. They come early, they're there at 8.30. They get breakfast. They're in the service. They get fed at the end. They've now got a truck, the Brisbane boys who set up this ministry, amazing young men, not Christians, but they felt a compassion for, for the homeless. You know what, they've jolly got a truck, got a shower in there, also a washing machine and a dryer and they go to the homeless places. Now it's everywhere in Australia. And we got them parked next to our church. And there they are. They're Aboriginal men and women. They can have their clothes washed once a week. They can have a shower because they live out in the streets. Beautiful people, beautiful people. About 15 of them came forward for prayer. You should have seen them. They're not little babies. I said, now I want you to, to submit to Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put your hands like this. I said, now receive what you need. What miracle do you need? You receive it. I said, I'm going to lay hands on you, anoint you with all. And, then, and it was like God encountered them. I, I want to see what actually took place. But they're fantastic people. What they do, how they, how they serve, how they're, 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 they're committed. And uh, they're, they're amazing. Kath and I, we've made the decision to actually go back in July for three Sundays so John and Sue can go and have a holiday. They haven't had a holiday. So I'm going to be rolling up my sleeves, mopping floors, helping Kath, if she'll let me, make the food. And uh, you've got to believe it. I mean, these, these indigenous guys, they, they, they love their cup of tea. But they fill it up right to the brim. So, oh, this, and it's spilling everywhere. Well, who has, I had to grab the mop and shh, follow them afterwards. I've got to say to them, guys, just can you do it two thirds full and then come back for a second one? But ah, you've got to love them. It's ministry, it's serving, it's helping. It's encouraging them. It's spiritual warfare. Three weeks beforehand, there was a terrible fight, a shocking fight. And John had to actually grab the two people and take them out. It was a woman that was attacking a man. And I saw her two weeks later, she had this massive great cut that had been stitched up on her face. I mean, drugs, alcohol, violence. But we're there to minister to them. We take the sword of the spirit and we say, you know what, we're going to to, to minister life to people, give them the word. And so he says here, pray in the spirit at all times, on every occasion, stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere and pray for me also. Ask God to give me the right word. So pray for me and Kath as we go back up there at the end end of June. Prayer in the spirit is prayer that is prompted and guided by him. Just as God's word is the sword of the spirit, which he himself employs. The spirit has been given to us to be our helper. And he powerfully supports us in our prayer life when we're under pressure. And you will face pressures. When you're facing some unexpected trial or temptation, it'll come. Look what Paul says in in Romans 8. He says, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. Oh, at times I feel so weak. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. Ever been like that? Yeah, many times. God, I don't know what to pray. Don't know how to pray. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. 
I think he's alluding to glossolalia and, and, and heavenly prayer language. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. We can, we can, we can only be assured that we are praying according to God's will when we're praying in the Holy Spirit's power. Hey, when I was here to stay, I'm about to preach the word, I've got an hour. So Kathy's on the bus run and she's picking up people, this is Alice Springs. And I'm sitting down there and I said, Kathy, you go there, I just need an hour to look over my message and uh, over some omelette and bacon and some at, at, outside restaurant. I'm eating away and I'm looking at my notes. And this person comes up and says, oh, are you Bill Vasilakis? And I said, yep, that's my name. He goes, oh, I'd like to talk with you. I said, well, look, I'm really busy. I said, I'm, I'm just preparing a message for that. And he said, oh, it won't take long. I said, oh, right, sit down. This person starts talking to me, smiling, but I wouldn't melt in their mouth. And they said, oh, we just want to know, what happened in Alice Springs late last year? I said, well, I didn't want to say to him. I said, well, look, I said, look, quite simply, I said, it broke our hearts. I said, we, I said, we just, you know, we just, adhered, the, the board of the Christian families adhered to the guidelines the Northern Territory government was saying and that nobody, who's, anyone who's not vaccinated just can't serve and work in the church. With that, she got up and she started cursing me, viciously. You're the Antichrist. You got the mark of the beast on you. How can you support the government? I curse you. I pray every church that you have here closes down. Boom, boom, like, like vicious. Like I'm thinking, wait, and I just said, I said, interview's over. I said, interview's over. I think we better. And people are looking in out there. And I'm thinking, this is really great. So she's gone berserk. Viciously. It was like a spirit of witchcraft came on her. And I'm about to minister the word. So, so I just said, look, I, I don't want to enter into this. I said, look, you know, let's just agree to disagree and be agreeable about it. We can choose to be disagreeable. We just, that's our position and that's where we're moving. So I've got, I've got to get my mess. And she just wouldn't stop. And then ultimately, I just, just looked down, finished eating, and she took off. Afterwards, I'm sitting there thinking, that's weird. And I found myself shaking. Somebody viciously, ugly, Horrible words. I want to curse you and curse the churches and close them down. And I thought, oh, well, I've got to go and preach in another half hour. So I quickly paid the bill. And as I'm walking to the car, you know what I did? I started using my spiritual heavenly language and I didn't know what to pray, how to pray. And I let the Holy Spirit just speak to me. And, and, start, and I started speaking in, in this brand new language. I went into the car. And then when people, I got a bit louder in the car, you know, of course, because I was walking there. And, and by the time I went to church, I preached the best message I've preached in 10 years. I think so. Even I got blessed as I was listening to myself. <laughs> the whole, you need the Holy Spirit. You that, that's not going to happen to you. Happened to me. But it came unexpectedly, out of the blue. What do you do? I needed the Holy Spirit's power and presence to manifest in me and that gift of being able to speak in that prayer language fortified me and prepared me to be able to handle the responsibility of ministering to precious indigenous people and a bunch of white fellows as well. And so you need the Holy Spirit, you need him. Today's the day of Pentecost, Sam mentioned that. Folks, you need your own personal Pentecostal baptism in the Spirit. In Acts 2, it says, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. You can receive this experience. You can receive this personal supernatural prayer language. It'll liberate your prayer life. It'll empower you and your witnessing ability. Hey, I, I have produced two little booklets. One is on baptism in the Holy Spirit. It's available on where my books are and also in the entranceway and also water, baptism and communion. End of the month, baptism in water. We'd love to baptise you. Read it, pray, ask the Lord to guide you. Baptism in the Holy Spirit. Read the booklet. This, hundreds of people have come to, to, to receive through just reading this booklet. I share my story. Come prepared for Tuesday night the 14th for the Holy Spirit night. We'll pray for you to believe to come through with this experience. It's for you.
Look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, and I'll conclude with these verses, they're fantastic. For if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to God, since people won't be able to understand you. Bypasses your mind, you'll be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will all be mysterious. So you don't lose control of your mind, you yield control of your speaking faculties and allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. So I was walking to my car and driving my car and speaking in this brand new language. Any religion that says you lose control of your mind is a cult. We don't adhere to that. We yield control of our speaking faculties, but our thinking, we we put our minds on Christ. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, if I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying, but I don't understand what I'm saying. Well then, what shall I do? I will pray in the spirit, I will also pray in words I understand. I will sing in the spirit, I will also sing in words I understand. And Paul says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you. The sword of the spirit, the word of God. Prayer in the spirit, you need both these offensive weapons to be able to overcome all the temptations And all the issues of life that come your way, not necessarily they're all of the enemy, but you need God's word in you. You need the Holy Spirit, not just in you because he's in you if you're a Christian. You can't be a Christian without the Holy Spirit, but you need his baptism, his immersion, his empowerment to be able to give you an ability to pray outside of the dimensions and limitations of your own thinking. Let's stand together as as I lead you in a prayer. As we're standing in his presence, let's just close our eyes for a few moments. If you haven't given your life to Jesus and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the time to open your life and allow Jesus Christ to become at the very centre of your life, to save you, to forgive you, to change you, to transform you. Open your heart to him. Maybe he's calling you to get baptised in water. And this is a challenge, to obey him, to trust him like Jesus did. Or he's calling you to be baptised in the Holy Spirit to receive your spiritual heavenly prayer language that you need. You don't know how much you need it. But in the day of trouble, in the hour of temptation, in the crisis moment when you don't know what to say, how to pray, what to do, you need God in you, praying through you in a most physical, powerful way. Father, I pray for everyone here. Save people, Lord, today. Challenge people to get baptised in water just to obey Jesus. And Lord, inspire us to want to receive all that you have to offer and this wonderful ability through the Spirit. Help us. Help us to make a commitment that we will imbibe your word in our lives, that we will memorise scripture, that we will read it and take hold of passages, that we memorise it, that we imbibe it on the inside so that your Holy Spirit has the raw material to use to help us live by faith, help us to overcome the enemy through the Word. I pray, touch every heart, touch every life that's here now. In Jesus' Name, Amen.